Well, we're going to move on now to the penultimate uh, uh, presentation in session one, uh, where we are focusing on telemanagement of very small in vivo devices. And um, the next topic is going to focus on the networks that would control these very small implantable devices. There are going to be some significant uh, challenges in, we already have the problem that sometimes with our ex vivo devices, we can't um, sort through all of the network problems to get all the protocols compatible and whatnot. Um, what is there beyond Bluetooth and uh, beyond some of the uh, network protocols that we have today that we would need for body area networks? So our next uh, presenter is Dr. Julian Pender, who is um, from the um, Hulse Center, IMEC, is an expert in the area of body area networks, and his title is Potential and Challenges of Body Area Networks for personalized health. Again, right on topic uh, with this conference. Uh, Dr. Penders, could you please join me at the podium? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, let me, right. so first I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Rothblatt, Dr. Forsten, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I look forward to all the interesting talks that we will hear and have heard today already. Um, maybe just a bit of background about uh, Whole Center and IMEC. So uh, IMEC, to, to get started with, is the uh, European largest uh, independent research center on micro and nanoelectronics. So it's mainly based in, in Leuven. And Whole set Center was a joint uh, initiative uh, by both IMEC and TNO, which is a Dutch research organization, started three years ago um, to look at uh, applications of uh, wireless sensor networks and, and smart faults in the different application areas, one of them being uh, healthcare. And so that's going to be the, the focus of the talk uh, today. So maybe just a bit of background about the, the whole center IMEC again. So this is an independent research center founded by IMEC and TNO uh, back in 2005. And we based in uh, Eindhoven in, in the Netherlands. Uh, our mission is to uh, perform research on generic solutions along two activity lines. One is on autonomous wireless sensor nodes and the other one is on smart faults. Um, we, so we started in 2005, so we're still in the process of building up critical mass. Today, the size of the research center is about 160 people. Uh, we're partnering with both universities and industry worldwide. Um, some of our, our uh, partners actually range from a uh, semiconductor industry, um, such as uh, NXP, ETI, uh, National Semi, but also looking into more uh, consumer electronics and application partners, such as Philips, Panasonic, for, for example. So more information can be found on the website. I'll also be happy to share some more info with you uh, during the breaks or, or these two days. Um, so getting to, to the topic now, um, I used to start this talk with a visionary slice on body our networks. Um, but things have changed and now we start seeing the first body our network systems uh, available on the market. So I'm gonna start just with what you can find today. Um, typically it will be for applications in the wellness and, and lifestyle. The first one is Emotive. So Emotive is a company based in, uh, in the West Coast in the States and they've introduced uh, brain activity monitors to control games. Quite similar story is, is the NeuroSky, also Californian-based, uh, which developed a system to, to read your mind. In the field of uh, sports and lifestyle, Nike. Nike makes you run, so Nike, Nike has uh, introduced uh, uh, this uh, small sensor node to monitor activity and to record how many miles you run and what's the activity. Also related to that, uh, uh, Adidas, together with Potter, has uh, developed body area networks for fitness monitoring. And also, last but not least, uh, Nintendo with the uh, Wii uh, platform, which has revolution uh, revolutionized the field of uh, video uh, uh, games. So that's for wellness and lifestyle. If we look at uh, mental health monitoring and emotion monitor monitoring, we also see uh, emerging uh, uh, concepts or product concepts. This one is a product concept from Philips. Uh, so this is a probe, a necklace, that will uh, gather signals from your body area networks and that will uh, extract relevant information with regard to your mood or to your emotions. Right? And so the widget is that if you change mood, the color of the device will change, right? So green if, you, if you're happy, red if you're uh, angry. Right? 
Uh, well, these are ad hoc or small products uh, early uh, um, adopted in, in the market. If we look at uh, industry in a more global way, then we have uh, open industry alliance that are introduced. An example of these ones are the Continua Health Alliance, which is uh, an alliance of about 200 uh, companies uh, with a focus to uh, improve the quality of personal health care. And the main focus is to look into standardization and interoperability, interoperability of different type of devices. And so the first milestone from the Continual Health Alliance was to uh, 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 send out and to define a first standard for interoperable systems. And this one was actually based on Bluetooth. And so we'll see what, what will be the, the next step. If we look at what they're aiming at, it's a personal health ecosystem. And so this system is, um, yeah, this is illustrated here. So you have different, different components, starting from the sensors to actually the connectivity, then the aggregation database server, and then finally the services that you can build on top of it. So the whole center is part of the, of the Continual Health Alliance, and uh, we fit in the picture at the, the place of the technology. So the focus of the whole center is to develop emerging technologies that can be used in body area networks. And as such, the Human++ program is looking into possible applications of this technology in the field of healthcare, wellness, and lifestyle. So this is the visionary side that I was mentioning before, the vision of people carry body, uh, carrying body area networks for different type of applications. So our main activities focus on really using a, a, a new technologies that are developed in our centers or together with our partners and developed early prototypes of, uh, the, to illustrate the possible benefits of these new technologies. One example is the wireless ECG patch. So EKG is, is a, a field in healthcare monitoring which is well known, and the whole system has been around for uh, many years already. So this, uh, this uh, attempt was to actually try to improve existing whole systems by decreasing the size, increasing functionality, and bringing the system closer to the body uh, in order to uh, enable comfort of use. This system uh, relied on a uh, technology achievement from AMIC, which was the design of a ultra-low power ASIC for the readout of biopotential signals, one of them being uh, ECG, which power consumption was uh, driven down to 60 microwatt for the readout, I mean, for the ASIC readout. This readout was integrated in, in a, in a, with uh, microcontrollers and radios to enable a, a wireless ECG patch that the user could wear in any type of environment, being at work, being uh, uh, doing sports, or uh, being at home, and eventually get monitored in a continuous way. Uh, this type of technology is usually recognized as being one of the building blocks, one of the enabler for uh, telemedicine, for remote medical monitoring. That was an article in EE Times end of last year that uh, points this particular technology as being this, the building block, really the starting point from this type of approach. Of course, if we want to, to use it on the field, if we want to actually uh, transfer it to, 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 uh, to the people, to the end user, it's very important to validate the technology. So we've done some tests on these patients. So, okay, what type of signals would you get if you, uh, are, if you are at rest, if you're working in front of your computer? Typically, the signals are of very good quality, which you can see there. But if you start jogging, well, of course, you will introduce motion artifacts. The system will start moving. You have buildup of charge. This will affect your signal. And that's what you see here, a bit of noise on the signal. What now if you start running? And even worse, if you are playing soccer and you're in a sprint event, then you have these type of signals where you can see definitely some pollution from motion artifacts. And this is typically the type of trade-off and the type of challenges that we need to investigate. How do we get rid of these artifacts by designing better systems or designing better algorithms? As an anecdote, another trial that we've done was at the Brussels Marathon. So we've tried this system uh, with the medics over there. And uh, just for the anecdote, it was actually quite nice. Because if you look at the, uh, these type of events, they usually don't have any means to look at the EKG, at least in Europe. So this was actually helping diagnosis uh, hyperventilation even that one of the lady there uh, got during, during the marathon. So getting the data is fine. Uh, um, streaming the data is good. But for most of the applications, especially in remote telemonitoring, we need actually to get access to the information which is stored in the data, not in the data itself. So one step further is to actually look into a way to do embedded processing of the data and eventually leading to knowledge streaming. So a step we've taken towards that direction was first to uh, embed on the smart ECG patch, on the patch that I just showed, to embed a, uh, first a beat detection algorithm, how do you robustly detect uh, the beat, and further than that, a complete delineation uh, algorithm in order to extract all the fiducial points from the ECG being P wave, T wave, and QRS uh, complex. Once this is done, not the complete data need to be sent over the wireless thing, but only the extracted information. Of course, that will decrease your bandwidth, hence that will save a lot of power, therefore increase the autonomy of the system. 
So in the second step, when you send the extracted information to a computer or to a, a mobile phone, for example, this computer can take care of doing further data aggregation and extracting the knowledge out of the information you have. Right? And eventually, this knowledge is what is interesting to take, uh, to take appropriate decisions based on the health status. This knowledge could therefore be feed, fed back to the patient itself or to a clinicians or maybe to a call center simply to take, to take any action. So EKG is one example. Another example is wireless sleep staging. So, so uh, why, uh, sleep monitoring today is performed in, in uh, uh, well, typically in hospitals. It's a quite a painful process. I don't know if somebody, some, some of you have been through a complete body sonographic recordings. You get, so there was about 20 wires everywhere on your body. So this is definitely a field that would benefit from wireless technologies as well. Um, so what we've done there is develop a prototype, which is pictured there on the slide. So you, as you see, it's, it's a quite crude prototype. The idea there is to uh, understand and to investigate whether this type of technology will actually help, would benefit the field, in that case, of sleep, of sleep monitoring. So we've done a clinical trial, and a very small clinical trial, I should say. So it's a population of 12 healthy subjects to actually validate the wireless system uh, against uh, reference equipment. And so we asked uh, uh, people to actually wear the two systems, on one side the wireless system, on the other side the reference systems, for a night of sleep at the hospital, and then we asked clinical experts to actually look at the data from these two systems, score them in order to get a sleep profile or hypnogram, and then look at similarity between these hypnograms coming from on one side the wireless system, on the other side the reference system. And we can compute similarity percentage between these two systems. And so what we've seen is that in average, we have about 80% of hypnogram similarity. So this number should be compared to test, retest uh, 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 numbers for sleep scoring. And if you look at uh, uh, the test, retest similarity between two, two uh, uh, clinical experts, typically that will be around 80 to 85%. So we're typically in the same range of uh, similarity in this case. Another example is uh, the monitoring of physiological responses, uh, uh, of physiological signals reflecting responses from the autonomic nervous system. This can be a, a starting point to actually extract emotion uh, of the user. So there was a whole, as I was mentioning at the beginning, there was a whole interest to actually be able to objectively assess the emotions of uh, people rather than subjectively as it is done today by questionnaire all these type of, of, uh, of applications. So in this case, we've developed also a prototype system relying on, on the uh, ultralopera technologies to monitor on one side uh, EKG and respiration, on the other side at the wrist, uh, monitor skin temperature and um, uh, galvanic skin response. And then we use this data, we process it in real time in order to get to an estimation of the arousal. So rather than talking about it, I, can, I have a movie. Uh, so let's see if that works. Yeah, so this is the type of, of, of output that you can get. Uh, so you get the four signals in real time. You process the signal, so you do feature extraction, and then you map that into uh, uh, estimation of, of arousal. And then you have this type of graph which represents your arousal level as a function of time. Uh, so the, as you go there, you will have different excitement, different arousing events that will eventually uh, uh, give you a, a response that way. So these graphs correspond to three uh, uh, tests. One is the Stroop test, which is a, a typical stress test. The other one is a music, uh, uh, a music extract that is quite relaxing at the beginning and then starts getting annoying in the middle and you see these two peaks due to that. And the last one is actually a movie which is quite calm at the beginning and then you have a building up phase then eventually it gets to an arousing even over there. So uh, just to illustrate that, the, the movie will show you, yeah. So, okay. Can you so on the, the screen song? you'll be able to see the... Can you switch uh, off the sound of the movie? Yeah, can you switch it off? Yeah. So what you see here, um, you see the, the three signals, three of the signals I was mentioning. So in real time, so the, 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 you have one person wearing the system in real time. You have the ECG signal, which is shown there, the respiration and the galvanic skin response over there. Signals are analyzed in real time. You extract the beat, you extract the respiration rate. From that, you derive features still in real time, and then you map these features into a level of arousal. And then the, the uh, continuous, the instantaneous level of arousal is plotted here in this bar in this red bar, and the evolution of arousal over time is plotted in this, in this uh, uh, graph at, uh, over there. And so the, the subject is asked to watch a movie. Uh, so this is a movie, and you see there was, there was actually some building up phase here when the guy is going, uh, uh, is going uh, outside. And it's building up some stressful even. And you can see that the, the arousal bar here will, will actually start increasing because the, the, the movie is getting, is getting uh, uh, stressful. And then at the end of the movie, you have a very frightening event where you have a monster just popping up, and then you will see the oral bar is just getting, getting crazy. Okay, but just didn't put it here. Okay, so um, 
these are uh, all nice examples of what we can do today uh, by combining emerging technologies, which are basically early achievements of research programs, together with off-the-shelf uh, uh, components for the part of the, uh, of the system which is not available today. Uh, if you look at a couple of years uh, uh, forward, I would say between three to ten years uh, ahead, then the, the, the Holy Grail or the, the vision is to go towards autonomous wireless sensors. And I think we've been uh, discussing that aspect uh, already uh, earlier in these two previous talks where we were discussing about energy consumption and energy harvesting. So we believe that the key paradigm here, the key number to keep in mind is 100 microwatts. So if you want system eventually to be autonomous, when, when, by, what I mean by autonomous is eventually being powered by the environment, then the total, uh, the total power consumption should be around, around five, uh, 100 uh, uh, microwatts. So why these 100 microwatts? Just very briefly, that is, if you look at the energy which is available from the environment, being thermal, vibrational, RF, biochemical, we mentioned the biochemical energy earlier today, typically what you can generate over a square inch would be in, in the range of 100 microwatts, rule of thumb. So that sets, therefore, the budget for the, uh, um, different, oops, for the different component uh, of the system. Each of them have a couple of tens microwatts to actually work on. And this is really what drives the research center, uh, the whole center. It's really how can we accomplish that challenge for each of these components, having a front end that works on 20 microwatts, having a radio that works at and only consumes 20 microwatts. So this is the research challenge in the field of body, body area networks. So just to illustrate what type of breakthrough, what type of achievements we uh, can create if we address this field, this is an example of uh, uh, the case of EEG monitoring. Here I'm, I'm talking about surface EEG in comparison to the previous talk. So this is the, the, the road that we took from 2003 to 2008. In 2003, we had this big shoebox. Uh, it consumes about 300 milliwatts. And in 2008 today, we have this little sensor cube. So how, how was this, uh, this possible? Well, we uh, looked at developing uh, ultra low power ASIC for the monitoring of EEG. That will decrease power consumption. That will also increase functionality. So overall, the size of your system will decrease, but also uh, uh, the functionality of the system will increase, and eventually that should result in an improve of quality of life for, for the patient. Bringing that even further, uh, we've developed uh, first prototypes of fully autonomous wireless health monitors. So these systems that you see there uh, are batteryless. So they are powered by either thermal energy coming from the body or by PV, so that, that means by light energy available in the environment. So typically you need to really balance the power consumption of the system with the power which is available from the environment to get to these type of autonomous systems. Of course, today these systems are big. You will not see patients working with that in hospitals. We are aware of that. But that sets, the, that sets the scene. That means we still need to work on miniaturization. We still need to work in further decreasing the power. But this is getting, uh, uh, getting at reach. So this is the vision that we have. So eventually, once we can decrease the size of the system, increase the functionality, we will get to this type of embedded sensors, embedded in accessories such as a cap or maybe also implantable. So I'd like to, to, to wrap up the talk with uh, another visionary slide. So this is a vision we have uh, for, the, let's say, uh, five to 10 years ahead. And so that will be a patch type of system that, that embed all the electronics which is needed to actually sense the signal, transduce the signal, do some processing, and eventually wirelessly transmit it to the outside. Of course, different form factors could be uh, in, uh, foreseen. If you look at uh, one monitoring, then you may want to have something which is more a bandage type of system. And as we discussed, maybe also we will go towards implantable systems on, on even the longer, the longer run. But in any case, the vision is to go to to towards truly unobtrusive monitoring solutions. If you want to address that, then the key challenge is to go ultra low power. As I said, think 100 microwatts. This should be the ballpark number. In order to meet that, we need ultra low power components. We need ultra low power radios. We need ultra low power DSPs. We need ultra low power sensor readouts. We also need to enlarge the number of sensors we have. I didn't have time to go over that, but besides physiological signals, we also want to look into biochemical markers. How do we measure uh, uh, chemical components in, salt, in body fluids, such as saliva, blood, etc.? This is also a challenge that needs to be addressed, all, always at ultra low power. Of course, system level power optimization and power management is key, and eventually, energy harvesting to enable truly autonomous system will also be required. All these nice technology together, it's good. We need, to, we need to integrate the technology, so technology integration is needed, and for that, integration technology is needed. Think that the body interface is eventually what will uh, determine the, the user acceptance of the system. If you want to attach something on the body, it has to be comfortable. So we need to work on the body interface. Think of dry electrodes, think of adhesive patch to, to stick to your body. From an electronic point of view, it means that 2D stretch of flex integration will be required. 
And eventually, addressing these challenges will lead to a, a body or network which can be used for applications along the continuum of care. For outpatient, if you're healthy, then at risk and then towards chronic disease management. And finally, also for inpatient. Okay, the very last slide. Um, in the Netherlands, we don't have snow very often, but when we do, we take pictures of our building because we think it's pretty. So this is an example of the, the building uh, that, we, uh, that we have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Penders. Uh, fascinating uh, talk, uh, very much uh, on point for the conference. Um, we have 10 minutes now for people to approach the microphone with any questions. Um, please introduce yourself and if you feel comfortable, your affiliation. Hi, Melanie Swan, MS Hi. Futures Group. I was just curious at the research center if you're if you're looking at two-way processing in the sense that you discussed a lot of information collection and broadcast activities. What about also using the body area network to bring processing or connectivity on board that could then be interfaced with, with a smart contact lens or, or eyeglasses or so forth? Yeah, this is definitely, definitely an area of research. So we have activities on, on the Ultraloparo digital signal processors we, where we both look at the uh, hardware aspect of things but also the, the software, so the algorithm aspect of things. And a very key question there is, is the uh, topic of distributed processing or distrib distributed processing architecture. So what is, what is the trade-off be between running an algorithm on the gateway, so the mobile phone or the PDA or maybe the computer, and on running the algorithm on, on the sensor node? Right? So what are the trade-offs here? You will save in power consumption because you decrease your bandwidth, but you will increase power consumption because you need to run uh, a local processing on the node. So all these questions, all these trade-offs are something that we're definitely looking, uh, looking into here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question from Dr. Borge, UAB. Bob Borge. I have Hi. to say I brought an Alabama telemetry system here. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> it's probably in low the, power. In the 29 years I've been in medicine now, almost 30, uh, it it's always amazes me how things are, are going, uh, going forward. Literally, this was the size of the uh, power strip to the first telemetry system I purchased at the VA hospital in Birmingham in 1982. Yeah. So things have changed a lot. Congratulations. Okay. Thanks. Thank you Thanks for much. coming. Thank you. That was a great talk, and um, really appreciate you coming from Netherlands to share that with us. And I certainly see a lot of potential for additional collaboration with the whole center from uh, many of the companies um, present here today, including our own.